There are a lot of rules you've got to follow at Disney World, but what about those unofficial Disney rules that the pros say you have to follow or else your trip will be a massive failure? Well, sometimes rules are meant to be broken, and that's what we're talking about today on DFB Guide. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Vlog. Whether it's a super popular tip that you've read about in all the guidebooks or your neighbor told you that you might not even go to Disney World at all if you don't do this one thing, well, I'm here to tell you that sometimes it's okay to break those rules. Certain things may not work for you or your family and that's totally understandable and we've collected some really, really popular tips that, well, there's a lot of reasons to break those rules. So are you ready to learn how to break all the rules at Disney World? Let's get started. Okay, here's when to break those tried and true rules in Disney World, and I'll cop to it. We've given this advice, because for a lot of people, it really does work. But my job is to make sure you have the best Disney World trip you possibly can, so I'm giving you the circumstances that you need to think about that could possibly negate all this stuff for you. First up is skipping the must-do rides and attractions. Now, it's no surprise that Disney World has dozens of incredible rides and attractions. Many of them are fan favorites for lots of different reasons. Maybe they're a classic Disney ride like Dumbo the Flying Elephant. People go so crazy for Dumbo. And I get that it's a Disney World staple, but why wait in a longer line when there are plenty of other spinning rides with much shorter wait times? Catch a ride on the magic carpets of Aladdin, which is also in Magic Kingdom, or Triceratops Spin in Animal Kingdom. You'll save yourself some pressure time. You don't have to ride Dumbo. It's literally the same ride as a bunch of other things that don't have the same wait time. <laughs> now, another type of ride you might feel pressured to go on are thrill rides like Tower of Terror. And hey, they may be great for thrill seekers, but if you have issues with motion sickness, I don't really think you're ruining your vacation by avoiding an attraction that's going to make you puke. Now, personally, I didn't ride Tower of Terror for a long time because I swore I was having a heart attack every time I rode it. <laughs> Eventually, I got over it and I ride it all the time now. But hey, if you need to go through a few years of, you know, anxiety and I don't want to ride that ride, that's okay. You do you. No matter what your friends and family say, you don't have to ride anything you don't want to ride. And when a ride is the hot new thing at Disney World, you might feel especially inclined to ride it like Rise of the Resistance. But if you truly couldn't care less about Star Wars, why should you wake up at the crack of dawn and try to get on a ride you're not even interested in? It's totally okay if you don't want to ride Rise. I understand. That said, I will say, even if you are a person who doesn't care about Star Wars, it is still a pretty exceptional ride, but that's mostly because they're pushing the envelope in so many different ways. If you're not a theme park junkie, if you're not a ride geek like I am, and if you don't care about Star Wars, then this may be a huge waste of time for you. Now, different rides are for different people and your trip isn't ruined because you missed out on some of them. In those cases, yeah, of course you don't wanna waste your precious time and money waiting in line for attractions that just aren't for you. You and your family know what you guys want to do just because Aunt Susan or your barber or your kid's yoga teacher say that you have to do X, Y, or Z in Disney World does not mean you have to do X, Y, or Z in Disney World. Now, it's the same deal with restaurants. A character meal at Chef Mickey's or Cinderella's Royal Table can deliver a solid Disney experience, but they are also incredibly pricey and hard to book and can create a ton of stress in your life when you're trying to get to these places. So if your family isn't into meeting characters or chowing down on some mediocre food that costs more than like your mortgage, then you don't need to shell out major dough for that experience. Choose something else. We got lots of other great character meals. You guys know I love myself some Garden Grill. It's much easier to book. It's less expensive. And you still get to see Mickey Mouse. He's wearing his farmer clothes. It's adorable. So there are lots of other experiences that won't cause you the same amount of stress on your heart or on your wallet. Now, ultimately, the things that people tell you are make or break for your Disney vacation might not be, after all, depending on your family's interests. So you guys make the choice, but definitely do that plan. It makes a lot of sense to look into this stuff beforehand and figure out what must do situations are the ones that your family really must do. Now, as you know, we got a great resource for that here at DFB. I write a book every year that's all about basically everything food and event related in Disney World. Tons of food reviews, my personal recommendations for things. So if you're not sure which restaurants to visit, pick up that guide. You can get it over at dfbstore.com. Just use code YouTube and you can get a discount. And it's a 100% money back guarantee. If you don't like the book, just email us and we will say, no problem, here's your money back. And there's no questions asked. So try it out, see if you like it, see if it helps. If it doesn't, 
no problem. All right, next rule you may need to break at Disney World. Bring your own food instead of eating at Disney World restaurants. Now, some people may not realize this, but you can bring your own food into Disney World. Just because Disney has tons of restaurants to choose from, literally like 200, and Mickey-shaped snacks at the turn of every corner, doesn't mean you're required to eat them or eat at those restaurants. You can definitely bring a cooler into the park with you as long as it fits Disney's size requirements and doesn't contain glass items or loose ice. And that cooler can save you hundreds of dollars and potentially some time as well. If you don't want to lug all that into the parks with you, there are a few options for having your own food at your resort too. You can have groceries delivered by services like Garden Grocer or Instacart right to your resort. They'll be kept refrigerated or frozen as needed at the front desk and you can pick them up yourself or have them brought to your room for $6. Not only does this help you save money, but it'll help you save some space in your suitcase too. And if you'd rather go out and pick out your own stuff, the Orlando area is packed with tons of stores. So that's another good money saving option. Lots of groceries stores around. Just because Aunt Susan told you your Disney trip would be a failure if you didn't go to Chef Mickey's for breakfast every day doesn't mean you should drop hundreds of dollars to save you from your FOMO. You're the one paying all the money. She's not. You get to decide to do whatever it is that you want with that money. By the way, eating your own food in your resort or bringing your own food to the parks means you don't have to deal with the craziness that is mobile order right now. It also means that you don't have to spend time that you could be riding rides sitting at a restaurant. I know lots of folks that just pack their fanny packs full of snacks and they just eat those through the day. Now don't forget right now in Disney World you do have to be stationary and socially distanced in order to eat. So even if you're eating a snack out of your fanny pack you have to stop moving, you have to walk to the side, you have to be socially distanced in order to take down your mask and have a bite. All right, now this next one is a big one. Guess what guys, you don't have to get the dining plan. Now, just in case you haven't heard about it before, the Disney Dining Plan is something that can be added onto your Disney World Resort package that essentially allows you to prepay for meals. Don't be fooled into thinking this is gonna save you a ton of money. It's not, but it does let you prepay for your meals. When the dining plan option is being offered, it might seem like a surefire way to help with budgeting and alleviate some of the pressure of figuring out where and when you wanna eat. Everything is taken care of and paid for prior to your trip, meaning you don't have to keep a close eye on how much each meal, snack, drink, etc. is costing you, as long as it fits into your dining plan. But Disney strategically prices that dining plan in a way that will make you pay for the top end of the average amount of food people typically eat in Walt Disney World. They are not dumb, they are very smart. They know how much people normally eat and so the dining plan offers the very top end of that amount because they know most people aren't gonna eat that much and so they're gonna make themselves some money in the long run because you're gonna pay for something you're not eating. So yeah, if you get the dining plan, and I know a lot of you love getting the dining plan and that's great, but you do really have to plan to get your money's worth. There's nothing wrong with that, but if you're choosing the dining plan with the thought that it'll be a quick and easy way to cut down on your food budget and planning, you want to rethink that decision. You can still go with the dining plan without being strategic about which restaurants will get you the biggest bang for the buck, but then you might end up wasting a bunch of money, unless you naturally will always order the steak or the lobster for dinner every single night. Overall, if you feel like your family doesn't need all that food, it's perfectly okay to skip out on the dining plan. Oh, and also another fun tidbit about the dining plan, they don't include gratuity. So you will be charged gratuity at every restaurant you dine at for table service meals. So be prepared to pull out your wallet and still sign a credit card slip, even when you're on the dining plan. Okay, next rule you can totally break at Disney World. You guys, you don't have to stay on property. That's right, you don't have to stay in a Disney World hotel. Now there are more than 25 Disney World hotels and it might seem appealing to stay in the middle of all that magic. And it is, I love to stay there. You'll find certain perks like immersive theming that you won't get from off property accommodations. But the other side of that coin is that there's a huge price tag. You can find other great options off property. Some of them will even have the same perks as the Disney resorts like complimentary transportation. But if you're worried about being too far away, then opt for the hotels in the Disney Springs Resort area. They're walking distance from Disney Springs. You'll still have access to perks like booking Fast Passes 60 days in advance when Fast Pass is happening, and it'll be a much lower price. Another solid option is the Walt Disney World Swan and Dolphin Hotels. The Swan and Dolphin are within walking distance to Disney's Boardwalk, also meaning they're in close proximity to Epcot and Disney's Hollywood Studios. You can walk to both of those parks from the Swan and Dolphin. You don't need to break the bank for your hotel, especially if you know you'll be spending most of your time in the parks. You can weigh the pros and cons of each option to determine what best fits your needs and your budget. I know some people want to spend the majority of their money on a great hotel on Disney property, and I totally get that. That's me too. I stay on property all the time. 
But if a hotel is a hotel is a hotel to you, and you'd rather spend your time and money in the parks, then stay off property. It just makes sense. Okay, next rule you may need to break at Disney World is visiting during off-peak times. I often talk about taking advantage of Disney World when it's at its least crowded time of year, especially even with the capacity limits in place right now, the parks still get much busier around holidays, and we've seen some pretty significant crowds recently during spring break. And I know we tell you time and time again to avoid Disney during the summer and other especially busy times like New Year's Eve and Christmas, but sometimes you just can't. You've got work, you've got school, and, and dozens of other obligations that can get in the way of visiting Disney World during the perfect time. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't go if this is something your family wants to do. As long as you have an idea of what to expect when visiting Disney during peak times like summer or Christmas, you can still definitely have an enjoyable trip. We talk all the time about our tips for how to visit during those busy times. You can definitely have a great trip. Prepare for longer waits for things like rides, food, and even shopping, but still, there are tips and hacks and secrets that will help you out. Don't mess with your schedule or worse, miss out on a trip just because you've heard that you shouldn't go at a certain time. All right, now this is one that's near and dear to my heart. You absolutely can break the rule of waking up at the crack of dawn to go to the parks. Night owls kind of draw the short straw in Disney World, especially now that the parks typically close on the earlier side, although we do see that occasional late night at Epcot right now. A lot of our tips revolve around getting an early start to your day, whether that involves an early breakfast reservation or being at the parks right when they open or even before they open. But if you know for a fact that you or your kids will be cranky all day regardless of the amount of coffee you drink if you wake up earlier than normal, don't do it. You can still make the most of your day with a later start and it will likely be more enjoyable for you because you know you and you understand what you're like when you wake up early in the morning. And yes, I am talking about myself. The very end of the day can be similar to the very beginning of the day when it comes to shorter lines for rides. Plus, lines will be shorter around lunchtime and dinner time while most people step away to eat. And when scheduled shows like fireworks or parades are taking place, that's a great opportunity to take advantage of shorter lines, as long as those shows aren't must-dos for you. By sleeping in, you might have to forego doing everything since you're working with a smaller window of time to fit it all into. But if you're as committed to sleeping in as I am, that's a sacrifice you're willing to make for your physical and mental health. Yeah, it's cool to ride Seven Doors Mine Train with a 20-minute wait, but it's also pretty cool to not be miserably exhausted all day. It's important to recognize what works for you and having the perfect day might look different for you than it does for others. All right, next rule you can totally break in Disney World, watching every single fireworks show, parade, and nighttime show. Because you know what? Sometimes you just don't care. Yep. While Disney's nighttime shows can be seriously impressive, they do suck a lot of time out of your day, especially if you want a good spot. Scoping out the perfect viewing area for the fireworks or daily parade can waste precious time you could use for riding rides. And sometimes at the very last minute, a family will squeeze right in front of you or a kid might pop up on a dad's shoulders, totally blocking your view. Plus, most of the time, that's extra time spent in the sun on your feet. After a long day, that might do some damage. If you really don't care about the fireworks and you really don't care about seeing Mickey make his way down Main Street, well, don't bother. There are plenty of other ways to spend your time that will be more satisfying to you. And if you're traveling with little kids, keeping them up past their bedtime might be seriously detrimental to their sleep schedule and their energy levels the following day and your sanity. So instead, you can take advantage of shorter wait times and you still might get a unique glimpse of the fireworks from some rides like Splash Mountain or Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. You can probably get a better view of the fireworks by watching them on YouTube, to be honest. So yeah, don't spend your time watching the fireworks and the parades if they just aren't important to you. Listen, I was terrified of fireworks when I was a little kid, and I used to just go shopping in mouse gear while my parents watched the fireworks in Epcot every single time. I had a blast. No pun intended, and I liked it much, much more than watching the fireworks. Now I can actually handle watching fireworks, but my kid hates them, so we don't really watch them that much. And for a long time, he wasn't able to handle parades either, so we just went and rode other stuff instead of doing those things, and that's totally okay. 
Next rule you can totally break in Disney World, going to every single Epcot festival. Yeah, throughout the year, Epcot hosts a handful of different festivals, including the Flower and Garden Festival, Festival of the Arts, Food and Wine, Festival of the Holidays, and right now, the way they've got things scheduled, it is a year-round thing to have a festival in Epcot. Each one offers dozens and dozens of themed eats and outdoor booths throughout the park, and a perk is that you get to try all different kinds of foods because they come in really small portions. You don't have to choose just one sit-down restaurant. On the other hand, a huge downside is that there's basically no seating available, meaning you're out there sweating and standing while scarfing down your food. If this doesn't sound attractive to you, and believe me, I get it, maybe it's beneficial for you to skip the festival altogether and enjoy a meal while seated in the air conditioning. If you don't mess around with letting your food brave the elements, then the festivals probably aren't for you. Just because they're a huge draw for people visiting the park doesn't make Epcot's many excellent restaurants any less excellent. So go right ahead, save your money and stomach space on a bucket list meal in an environment that isn't 5,000 degrees. Okay, another rule it's totally okay to break, going on the Skyliner. If you're afraid of heights, the Disney Skyliner might not be your jam. And even if you're not typically afraid of heights, being suspended in a free-floating gondola 60 feet in the air and sometimes above water might totally freak you out. Luckily, Disney World has plenty of other transportation options, just in case conquering your fears didn't happen to make it to your vacation plans. That said, if you plan to take buses during your trip, make sure you allow yourself plenty of time to get from point A to point B. Like everything else in Disney World right now, buses have capacity limits, meaning you might find yourself spending a little bit longer waiting than you'd expect. Some of the times when bus waits are going to be the longest are in the morning when the parks open, no shocker, as well as in the afternoon when park hopping begins at 2 p.m. Now, this one may come as a no-brainer, but if you don't plan on using the Skyliner, you might want to pass up staying at a Skyliner resort. Those include Disney's Caribbean Beach Resort, Riviera, Pop Century, and Art of Animation. These hotels do offer bus services to Hollywood Studios and Epcot, but they don't run as frequently since another form of transportation is being offered. So if you're skipping out on using the Skyliner, the bus may serve as a daily obstacle for getting to the parks from those hotels. If you want to be in charge of your own travel destiny, you certainly can opt to rent a car but consider this your warning that you will have to pay for parking at your resort, which can range from $15 to $25 per night. You can also choose to use a rideshare service like Uber or Lyft. Disney previously offered a paid minivan service that functions similarly to Lyft, but it's currently unavailable. Just because the Skyliner is Disney's newest form of transportation doesn't mean that you have to ride it. If you know it'll make you uncomfortable, find a nice, comfortable seat on the bus and call it a day. Okay, guess what else you don't have to do in Disney World? You can break the rule of going to the park every single day. That's right. It is not a law that you have to go to the parks every day. There's an expectation that you should spend all of your time in Disney World at the parks, but there's so much to see and do outside of the parks. Whether it's around the resorts or at Disney Springs, a case can definitely be made for taking a breather from the hustle and bustle of the parks and seeing what else there is to explore. If you're shelling out lots of money to stay at a Disney resort, you better take advantage of what it has to offer. Disney resorts can have those great pools, so maybe kick back poolside to make the most of the money you've spent. You'll also find some free daily activities offered at your resort, and sometimes these include scavenger hunts, crafts, trivia, and more. You can typically find a sign in your lobby that'll share the daily schedule, or you can always ask at the front desk for an activity sheet. Another way to make the most of your time outside the parks is by heading to Disney Springs. You can find some of the best Disney restaurants on property there, and if you don't feel like spending an entire day at the Springs, plan for a killer brunch at someplace like Wine Bar George or Chef Art Smith's Homecoming. Believe it or not, there's more to Disney World than just the theme parks, so see what else is out there to do, and then you can save yourself a hundred bucks plus per ticket at the theme parks. Now, if you've got a family of four, imagine what you could do with $400 extra in your pocket. I bet it's a lot. All right, now I love this next one. The next rule you are allowed to break in Disney World is always going with your family. There is no unwritten rule claiming that you have to go to Disney World with your family or with friends or a significant other. So it feels silly to think that this will qualify as breaking a rule. But generally speaking, someone doing a solo trip to Disney World is definitely considered unique. So I'm gonna speak to this. 
the majority of my trips to Disney World are solo, and they have been for years. And honestly, it's glorious. Your trip is all about you and whatever you want to do. You design your day, where to go, where to eat, when to sleep until noon, and when to wake up at dawn and be at the Magic Kingdom when it opens. And you can also decide how much you actually want to plan beforehand or what you want to play by ear. If you're not used to dining in public alone, that's something you might want to practice beforehand if you think you might be uncomfortable with it. If you don't think you'll be satisfied by the mere combination of eating and people watching, consider bringing a book or headphones so you can listen to a podcast or audiobook while you're dining. And ultimately, don't get in your own way. You may not believe it, but there are likely thousands of other solo visitors in Disney World at the same time that you are. It's actually not that unique. If you're worried about feeling judged, well, maybe you might be, but not in the way you're expecting. I'd bet that some members of those families you're passing are pretty envious of the fact that you get to do this all on your own. When I first started visiting Disney World solo, I was a little nervous and I didn't quite know what to do with myself in the parks, but believe me, I got over that real, real fast and I think you will too. All right, the next rule you can totally break at Disney World is spending every cent you have. Yeah, it's no surprise that Disney wants you to buy their stuff. It's everywhere. Ears, spirit jerseys that cost like 80 bucks, magic bands, really obscure keychains. It's all there and it's really expensive. I know that some people have traditions where they buy a new pair of ears at the start of their trip and then wear them for the rest of the week. I get that. But are you wearing those $30 ears once you've returned home? Or how about that $90 lounge fly backpack? Are you bringing that to the grocery store with you? Chances are probably not. You can rack up some serious charges buying souvenirs for the folks at home, and it probably isn't worth the money. If you really need a Disney souvenir, you can find lots of great deals and sales on Shop Disney, which is Disney's merchandise website. And that includes items from the parks, and a lot of them are on sale. That way, you'll be able to save a little bit of money, and you'll probably feel less pressured to buy whatever that must-have thing is when you're not physically in the parks. But believe me, I understand the mental pressure and the emotional pressure to buy stuff in Disney World. My first time in Galaxy's Edge, I bought everything. I have a Porg. I have no idea why. Why do I have a Porg? It makes no sense. I built a droid. Why? Why do I have a droid? I don't even know where he is. His name is Fred. I don't know where Fred is. If anybody's seen Fred recently, please let me know. But it's really hard sometimes to not spend that money and buy those things that you may not even use in the future. So try to keep your head screwed on straight if you don't want to spend the money. But of course, if you want to, go for it. That's what this whole video is about. You do what makes you happy as long as it's not illegal. Okay, the next rule you can break in Disney World, planning everything. I tell you guys all the time that planning is a huge part of a Disney World vacation, and it is, but you can still have a fun trip without planning, especially if you go to Disney World regularly. And hey, you might even have a more enjoyable time without all the pressure of your packed schedule. You can have a lot of fun just playing it by ear in Disney World rather than being glued to your calendar of minute-by-minute -minute events. It allows room for fun, unexpected things, and memories to happen. Plus, it eliminates a lot of opportunities for disappointment, too. Now, if planning is your thing and you're just not ready to relinquish all control, this is why we're friends, leave just a day or even a half day to be spontaneous. I know this can be tough in the age of park passes. You still have to decide beforehand which park you'll visit on which day so you can reserve your spot in a park, but you don't have to make a whole schedule of events for that day. Of course, if not having a plan stresses you out more than it relaxes you, then go back to your regularly scheduled programming, but there's no harm in trying it out. All right, now this one is super special for those of us here at DFV. And I know you guys are not gonna wanna hear this one, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Here's a rule you can break at Disney World, actually sticking to your diet instead of splurging on every meal. Now, I know that many of you will be upset to hear it, but you don't have to sabotage the diet you've been sticking to. Now, that doesn't mean you can't allow yourself one or two not on plan snacks. Treating yourself to a couple of snacks here and there doesn't mean you have to fall off the wagon completely. Prepare in advance so you know which dining locations have items on the menu that will fit into your diet or will at least help you splurge in moderation. You can research all the Disney World menus on allears.net and check out DFB articles so you know the best game plan to stick with your way of eating, whether that's low carb, vegan, low fat, etc. It might help to decide in advance which specific snacks are your absolute must haves. That way, you'll have designated a handful of snacks to be your splurge items and you'll feel much less tempted to stray from your goal. But it always shocks me that when we do write on Disney Food Vlog about healthier food or how to stay on your diet on vacation, I get hate mail from people telling me that they don't want me making them feel guilty for splurging on their diet on vacation. And it's shocking every single time. 
So again, you do what you need to do, but believe it or not, sometimes people don't want to completely splurge on their vacation. They do want to maintain their way of eating and that's absolutely okay. So don't feel bullied (laughs) into breaking your diet if that's not something you want to do. No one's going to judge you for falling off the wagon or going off plan on your vacation. That's what vacations are for, but please don't judge people for staying on the wagon or sticking to their diet plan. If that's what's good and healthy for them, then let them do that. Yeah, I know, that's weird. I feel like it's weird too, don't you? Okay, just, we're on the same page. All right, and the last rule that you can totally break in Disney World, meeting all the characters. I know the first thing that some people have to do when they visit Disney World is go see Mickey Mouse, but seriously, you don't have to see Mickey or any character for that matter if you don't want to. If characters creep you out or you just don't see the point in having a semi-awkward conversation with a princess, which I totally get, well then don't. This is especially true when it comes to character meals. Like I mentioned earlier, they're seriously pricey and typically only worth it if characters are your thing or characters are your kid thing and if aunt susan back home is just begging for a picture of your kid with mickey and minnie but they can't stand characters it's probably not worth forcing them to do it either so while you might feel like you just have to do some of these things in order to have a successful and memorable disney trip you don't some rules were made to be broken and i think you can definitely get away with breaking some of these tried and true rules on your own now i think something i said a little bit earlier might really ring true some people do feel bullied into having a certain kind of disney world vacation don't allow that to be you you can have whatever disney world vacation you want and although people are often giving you well-meaning advice and that's great that they want you to have a good time You need to do what's right for you and your family. And if that means changing up the game plan, breaking some rules, then that's excellent and I support you. Now, have you broken any of these rules before? Let us know in the comments. We wanna hear your experiences. And if you can think of some other unwritten Disney World rules that it's okay to break, go ahead and share them. Thank you guys for listening. Thanks for watching. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog and we'll see you real soon.